Back here, it's good to see you all. Um, I hope you'll forgive me. I've got a little rash here on my throat, and I just can't do my tie up. So uh, I hope that's all right. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. Love to see all the uh, kids. Uh, my wife and I had a few, but they're all grown now. They're all scattered in the four winds. We have grandchildren, but we don't get to see them often enough. So when we get around kids, we get a little dotty, I guess. So you have to bear with us. Um, if you'd like to read along with me, we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 1 for our text. I'm sorry, Isaiah chapter 61 for our text this morning. I really appreciate the invitation here. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, hold forth God's word of life to you and at any time that he gives me that opportunity. Isaiah chapter 61. We're going to read verses 10 and 11 for our text this morning. Isaiah 61, verse 10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For He hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride that adorneth herself with her jewels. For as the earth bringeth forth her bud, and as the garden causeth the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all nations. I believe that we're going to see the culmination at the end of verse 11 there in the millennial reign of Christ. The title of this message is simply Joy. And I know of no greater joy than the joy of the new birth. I don't know of any greater joy than that. Someone uh, recently was discussing uh, current events. And sometimes we can get caught up in current events. And sometimes current events don't look so good. And if we're not careful, uh, we can start to have a little bit of a negative attitude. And uh, we forget that we have a great joy. And there is no greater joy than that of salvation and knowing the Lord and knowing the truth, the saving truth of Jesus Christ, our Lord. So the title of the message is simply joy. And let's just briefly go to the Lord in prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we do praise you as Almighty Sovereign God, Creator, Sustainer of all life, provider for us. Lord, we do thank you for all the blessings you bestowed upon us. We do pray for the pastor and his wife as they're traveling, Lord, that you keep him safe and free from harm, and that you would bless him as he enters the pulpit. And Lord, I pray the same for myself, that you be my helper, Heavenly Father, and give me by your grace the wisdom, the utterance, the power of the Holy Spirit this morning, that your body here may be edified. In Christ Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Now, like many of you, I have known and I've had to deal with tragedy in my life. And likewise, there have been many happy occasions in my life. And of course, we always rejoice in the good moments that we have in our life. But there's no earthly event that produces the deep and fervent joy that we have in salvation. I say no earthly event because salvation is a supernatural event of divine work. It's not something we can do for ourselves. You know, we, we human beings, we're a curious lot. Sometimes we are so miserably alike, and yet we can be so refreshingly different. And I know there's been no difference in my life like the day the Lord saved me. And it has totally turned my life around. There's nothing like the joy of salvation. And I'm so thankful for that difference that the Holy Spirit has made in my life. And I'm sure you are thankful for that same thing. 
You know, God has shown me really the worm-like lowliness of my natural state. But by His grace, He has lifted me to unimaginable heights of joy and a future glory that is simply unattainable by my own hands or through my own work. And if you're here today and you're saved by the grace of God, you can say the same thing. There are many great reasons we have for rejoicing. One thing, God has forgiven and forgotten our sin. He has totally cast it behind Him. He does not bring our sin to His remembrance. As the psalmist said, it's as far as the east is from the west, it's no longer held against us. He hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. Secondly, God has made us one with Himself. The highest pleasures are those of fellowship with Him. And to know His mind. And we do know His mind. Christ said, if you know me, you know the Father. The Scripture says, For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him. But we have the mind of Christ. Not to instruct him, but that he might instruct us and comfort us. We do know the mind of Christ. Have you ever thought of it this way? To know the author is much more than to read the book. We have a book, we have God's Word, but we can know the author. As He reveals Himself to us and the truth of our Savior Jesus Christ, we know the author and the finisher by faith. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Here is our ultimate example that we see in Christ Jesus. Here then is the mind of Christ that we need to apply to our lives to be happy with our station in life. Not to be envious of, of popularity. Not to be envious of status. But to rejoice in a lifetime of humble, obedient service. And to do so fearlessly without thought of personal gain or gain or bodily harm. But to be fearless. Are you convicted by the Holy Spirit? Then you should have the courage of your conviction. Because God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Sometimes I think that uh, we, Christians, are not always fearless. Sometimes I think that it's easy and we're tempted to succumb to the, this culture today of political correctness. I know it's tough. I'm still working. Um, I'm 68 years old. I'll be 69 in a couple of weeks. I don't plan to quit working. I like working. But the work atmosphere could be kind of tough nowadays, especially if you're a Christian. But we need to be fearless. Um, Brother Allen said we should pray for our president. We should. We have a fearless president who's going against the grain at many of these things that we're seeing uh, have exposed much corruption. And we need to pray. We need to pray that this country would, country would be restored 
to those principles upon which this country was founded, namely the principles of God, the precepts and laws of God. There are great depths for us to plumb in rejoicing in God. Our text says, My soul shall be joyful in my God. Joy may be superficial. It's, it's really, it's foolish to deny the fact that there are pleasures which have their root in our passions and our emotions and our imaginations and in all of our accumulative faculties. But these things have their reactions and their limitations and their exhaustions. Do we find joy in little things that we do in our lives? We find joy uh, that, that is, is strictly on a human basis. And there's nothing wrong with those things when they are joys that are uh, profitable, joys that are lawful, joys that are according to God's Word. That's fine. But they're all exhaustible. But spiritual joy, is connected with the spiritual soul. It is immortal. And as such, it is ever capable of increase. There's simply no limit to the joys that our spiritual growth can attain. There's no limit to what the Holy Spirit will reveal to us and illuminate us with. There's no limit to how much we can grow in the grace and knowledge of our Savior, Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit will help us. Christ said, I'll send to you another comforter. He is our comforter. He is our intercessor. He is our advocate. But so is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is here for us. You're born again. You're born again of the Spirit. And Romans tells us our spirit intertwines the Holy Spirit. So now we, ha we have new doors we can unlock through the power of the Holy Spirit if we be in spirit and in truth. No limit. No limit to the supply of rejoicing we have in God. So you know what we need to do? We need to put on overalls and boots and a helmet and get picks and shovels and start to mine the unsearchable riches of Christ. It's not going to happen if you don't work at it. I think it's wonderful. The rejoicing we have in God is never liable to exhaustion like the joys we have in this world. And there's some great joys that we have. I enjoy my wife. I enjoy my grandchildren. I enjoy grilling out. I enjoy getting on my tractor and, and tearing stuff up sometimes, you know, or even once in a while doing something productive. Those are great joys. I'm removing a lot of brush in case you're wondering what I'm tearing up. But the joy of the soul that we have in our spiritual uh, ignition, our spiritual life, our spiritual awakening, there's no limit to that. There's no exhaustion to it. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out. They just are. We're never going to find them all out. We have the mind of God in that we know Him and can rely on Him. We can never instruct Him. We can never, never fathom God, at least I know I will. There are no limits to learning. No limits to exalting in the Holy Spirit of God. You know, our human spirit is capable of great emotion. Our feelings may sink to great depths sometimes. We may be sorrowful, or we may rise to heights of human joy. And we have no language which will express the degrees of spiritual distress and agony which we sometimes feel. It's possible 
to just be really despairing. I know, I've been there. And there's no way that we can measure the degrees of joy that we felt. Can you measure the joy that you felt when you were saved? When God showed you the truth? You remember that joy? Could you measure it? I could not. I'm still trying to plumb the depths of what happened to me that day on a mountain down in Virginia. I'm still trying to figure that out. God gave me so much. I can't fathom it all. All I know is the greatest day in my life. As I move further away from it in time, and we are, we're stuck in time, God's eternal. Time is just a parenthetical event in eternity, and we're stuck in it. And it's linear. We can't go back. We can't fix the things we wish we could fix. But from that day forward, as I've moved forward in time, I, I, I kind of don't like that. Because my human life has intruded upon the joy of my salvation. And sometimes I need to go back to God and say, help me and restore the joy of my salvation, just like the psalmist did. We need to be careful. We need to be careful not to get too far from that joy. We need to be careful and remember our joy. Because sometimes we're tempted in the wrong direction. The wise, learned, educated man is tempted to glory in his own wisdom. The rich man is tempted to glory in his own wealth. The mighty man is tempted to glory in his own power, his own prowess. But that kind of glorification is a weakness and a folly. It's not built on truth. It conducts to complacency and it ends in disappointment. It can end in shame. It's going to end in disaster. Is what it's going to end in. There's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Wisdom, true wisdom, is to rejoice in God. To glory in Him. That we understand Him and know Him, and seek to know Him more, and draw nearer to Him. Rejoicing in God is to be ranked among His people, and not get too far away from our delight in Him. His character provides a source for us of spiritual satisfaction that is absolutely inexhaustible. If we want to maintain our joy, if we want to increase our joy, we need to be close to Him. We need to be in fellowship with Him. God has done great things for us. He has given us the greatest of all deliverances, salvation. He has bestowed upon us the greatest of all blessings, righteousness. We could never attain righteousness for ourselves. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. But He gives us righteousness not ours. It's His Son. It's our Savior. Jesus Christ belongs to Him. He stands pledged to accomplish that in which we shall greatly triumph. You know, God is... is uh, <coughs> he gives us all these beautiful things in His creation. He gives us, you know, the founders back in that era, they used to often talk about the God of nature. They weren't talking about uh, like a lot of people worship nature. That's not what they meant. They meant that God created a natural order in this world. And nature, of course, is part of that order. Uh, 
God said there will be seasons. Okay? They're going to continue. We're not going to burn up because of global warming. We're not going to freeze because of... Listen, that kind of stuff is just silly. And it does not prove out in Scripture. Scripture says that God has created these things and they will continue. Our seasons will continue. I love spring. I love fall. This is one of my favorite times of year. You see things, the, these trees are beautiful, the leaves are turning, you see things are starting to turn brown, they're going to go to sleep, they're going to disappear for a little while, but then they're going to spring up. They're going to come back. As our text says, springing forth in the sight of all nations. And I said before, this is strictly, uh, 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 if you go back and study, they're talking about the millennial reign here, but it also applies to other things in our lives. We have also divine adorning. Salvation adorns us with righteousness. This righteousness belongs to the bridegroom. It is beautiful. It is spotless. It is entirely free of blemish or wrinkle. It covers up every one of our blemishes and wrinkles. It, it defines us as sinless. It allows us entry into the throne room before a pure and holy God. That's what we're wearing when we come to God in prayer, in spirit, and in truth, we are wearing the robe of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we appear before God free of any blemish at all. Christ's gifts of adornments urge that a sinner, a saved sinner, be fit for a place at the feast. You know, we weren't always fit for a place at the feast. What did he do? He fetched the poor beggar in from the street. He gave him a free invitation and let him respond to it with all his heart. But he still wants something before he can sit down with the rest of the guests there. What does he want? He wants to be attired like them. And so the bridegroom gives him this gift. He gives him a royal robe. And on this royal robe, it's adorned with uh, jewels and uh, many things. And we see this in our text. And in the New Testament, we see that we are bidden to put on our Lord Jesus Christ. The graces of Christian character are treated as a divine vesture in the robe of righteousness of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Christ has a great joy in those whom He has adorned. The joy of the bridegroom is of the bride who He adorns with beautiful garments and jewels that He Himself has provided and these things are an expression of His personal affection for His bride. That is how you can look at yourself if you are saved by the grace of God and you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You can look at that robe of righteousness and the jewels, all the things that He has given us and adorned us with, that's His personal affection that He has for each one. Each one, each child of God, each one that God has drawn to Himself through His Son, Jesus Christ. That's pretty special. That tells me that we're pretty special. We're different people. We're not like anyone else. I think that's wonderful. God's Word is something, when we look back at our text at verse 11 and we see this, uh, for as the earth bringeth forth her bud, I'd like for us to see this in this way. God's word as a seed. 
My wife is, is very fond of saying, well, I'll just plant a seed. We have, uh, we have some children and grandchildren that are not saved. We pray for them all the time. And my wife is planting a lot of seeds. She likes to plant seeds, and I'm glad she likes to plant seeds. And I'm not sure that I'm as good a planter as she is. I might water them, but maybe she's a better planter. But I try. God's Word is a seed. The Word of God in the mouth of the servant of Jehovah is the seed out of which great things are developed. And we see that in all the world. The ground and the soil, that is the Word. The world. Mankind is the harvest. Our job as the church is to hold forth the Word of life. Our job as a preacher, as a pastor, and, and all of you is still to hold forth the word of life, to testify, to testify on behalf of our God that He received all the praise, honor, and glory to elevate the name of our Savior above all others is to plant that seed. The impulsive force of uh, the seed or behind the seed is God. <laughs> joy. Joy we need to remember. It's a great act of joy to plant a seed. And to ever see that seed bear fruit. Have you seen that? I bet you have right here in this church. Have you seen some of these young people? Have you seen them say? You know? I mean, I, I know that Justin and Heather are so proud of their children. And you're all proud of your children. And I've watched young people in, in uh, uh, the church that I used to belong to come in, make profession. I've watched them grow. That's that seed. That's the Word of God that took hope in good soil and produced fruit. I don't know of any greater joy than that. Beside my own joy, you know what? I think i got just as much joy out of others and watching them as i got with my own joy. Now, that's a joy that's eternal. I, I just, I love it. I love it. It's a manifestation that we see. It's like nature. We're going into fall. We're going to go into winter. We're going to come into spring. A mystery is hidden during the winter months. But then, as nature hides, it also reveals. So the Lord will cause righteousness to spring forth. It's a great manifestation of power that we see when we see God's Word planted and then come to fruition. It's something more than mind that's manifested in the beauty of nature. You ever think about this? Beauty is only visible to reason. And it's a higher kind of reason. If you have horses, we used to have horses. You can ride horses through all kinds of landscape. They don't care. They don't recognize the beauty. They don't stop and say, wow, isn't that great? You know, they don't do that. Our dogs can care less about the flowers. My wife plants. And they might treat them like a fire hydrant. But they don't care. You know? But we care. We see the beauty there. That beauty appeals to a higher kind of reason. The reason of man. And so does the beauty of the fruition of God's work. It's a beautiful thing. I think the unlimited, inexhaustible, immortal joy of God is made manifest through His salvation. And it should be the predominant manifestation of salvation in each one of our lives. Our ultimate example is always the person and work of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Turn with me if you would. We're going to close here in just a minute. The Hebrews, the 
chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be weary and faint in your minds. Christ is our example. If He is our example, then He is also our Savior, our Master, and our Leader. We should follow our Leader, even while bearing the agony of the cross. It says here that His mind was on the joy that was set before Him. That too should be our method of enduring all of life's adversities. It doesn't matter what we're going through. I know that's not that easy to do sometimes, but He is our example. He's our leader. Now if you look to Romans 8, verse 18, you see the culmination of that for us. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So as Christ looked forward to that joy, that he knew he would have being restored to glory at the right hand of the Father. We too know that we're going to have a time in glory. And that's what we need to remember. Sometimes we have adversities and sometimes we're chastened. Back in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11, Now no chastening for the present seemed to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yielded peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. No matter the cause of our suffering, even if it's chastening of the God, no matter whatever it is in this present evil world, we must turn to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, to lift us up and to heal us and to restore our joy. We see a danger here that's expressed in verses 12 and 13, that if we're not instant in running to Jesus for this help, for this restoration of joy, that we risk suffering a, a depression. And depression can set in and greatly diminish the hope and the joy of our salvation. It can greatly damage our spiritual health. It can stunt our growth in the grace of our Savior. He is who we must look to. It is He we must run to. Do you know Him today as your Savior? I pray that you do. And I pray that you will call on His name if you do not and ask Him to show you the truth. Ask God to show you the truth because the truth will set you free. And then one day in glory, if you know Him, He will say to you, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. I pray that God's word will be a blessing to your hearts today. I thank you for the invitation. Well, Alan, I'll turn the service back over to you.